Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Matt Olin. And I'm Barb Gravel. On this edition of Prairie Mosaic, we'll visit a printing press museum in North Dakota, a county museum in northern Minnesota, and hear some seasonal music. Night, night. Donna Christie is originally from Texas, but she's lived for years now in Bismarck, and she's taken up her longtime passion, painting. Her impressionistic work is catching on with the art buying public. I'm Donna Christie. I love to paint because I love the juicy, brilliant colors. I just love to paint pictures that have that beautiful color and it seems to bring joy to people. It brings joy to me when I do it and it takes a lot of stress and burdens of the day off of me when I'm able to come in and, and just mix color and apply it to the canvas. We just got back from Scotland and my intention was to get lots of painting references that I could use for my paintings. And this was at one of the castles that we visited. We took a picture of some gardens. And this was a picture that we took there in one of the gardens of a castle there in Scotland. It's impressionist painting. It's just an impression of what I'm seeing. I start with a transparent undercoating. So I start on a museum quality white board, and then I come in with a mixture of a solvent that I get from Europe mixed with lanolin oil. And I thin down my paints and make a very thin wash and just get a basic outline of what I wanna paint. After that, I come back with just plain paint and just start creating. I've always had an artistic interest, but I didn't really know how to paint. I'd never taken any painting classes, but it was always something that was interesting to me. I always thought that I would like to learn how to paint. What started me deciding to buy paints and get started was the movie The Notebook. There's a scene in there where he makes a studio for the woman he loves. I just saw that and I thought, you know, I could do that. <laughs> My family was always teasing me because it would take me like six months to do a painting. Dreama Tulperi really changed the way I painted and she's the one that taught me this technique. I was able to finish several paintings in that weekend that I was at that workshop. And then I came home and started implementing what I had learned, just started really changing the way I painted and was able to produce paintings that could put on the wall in no time. I just want the paintings to be pretty. I want something for people to look at that brings them joy. Donna Christie came to our attention and I was immediately taken by her work, very much uh, impressionist. She seems to capture a moment out for a walk in the woods or out on the prairie. And that's what people pick up on. That's what they see when they look at her paintings. They imagine themselves on that trail, on that path. And she does it very, very delightfully. And she's gone over really well. The first night we sold six paintings. So that was exciting for me to see that people liked my art and were interested in it. Kim from North Dakota Council on the Arts was at my opening and said that she was interested in me exhibiting at the Capitol. And so that right now, my pieces are at the Capitol. It is overwhelming to me and very humbling to me that people do enjoy my paintings. 
I feel very honored that people want me to put my paintings in their gallery. And then when people actually enjoy looking at it, it is an unbelievable joy that I can't even explain. We're seeing more and more artists like her that have been painting for a long time, but never really thought about becoming commercial, if you will, or exhibiting, certainly, in a gallery. And we really encourage that. The opening reception, probably one of the better sales events that we had at a reception. North Dakotans in particular tend to be a little more reserved and they don't like to show off in front of other people and make a purchase. But in this case, a lot of people did and we were very happy and she certainly was as well. I hope to add more paintings back at Capitol Gallery. David and I have talked about that. the peace and the calm that comes over me. I turn on my music and I have my diffuser on with great essential oils and it just takes me away into a more peaceful place. And as I've gotten older, that has become very important to me to have that peace of mind, that joy and those colors on that canvas and being able to put them down with a brush or a palette knife and to create something that's beautiful to me and I hope beautiful to the people that look at it is a very calming thing that I really need in my life. There's a museum in Braddock, North Dakota that features old time printing presses. It allows visitors to take a step back in time to see how newspapers were printed years ago. We're at the Braddock News Letterpress Museum on the South Central Threshing Association grounds at Braddock, North Dakota. What's special is that it's uh, in a collection of letterpress equipment, antique equipment. Our oldest is about 1875, and we go up to about 1950. 1952 was the 500th anniversary of printing. Letterpress basically means using movable type or individual letters made from steel or wood or lead and printing a page or a news story with movable type. And until about 1960, the process was pretty much what Gutenberg used in that you had movable type or pieces of type and you were using a machine to press it against a sheet of paper to produce something. We have about everything that a small print shop would have had between 1885 and 1960 or later. It's unique to have the full range of equipment still in operating condition. Kids are fascinated by the, I guess, the moving parts of the presses that we let them run. And they, they like to turn the wheel and they like to see how it works and they like to see the ink go on and then they're very excited when they have printed something. And usually during the threshing show, we kind of become the unofficial babysitters because kids from about six, five, six to 11 kind of hang out here. And then depending on their level of enthusiasm, some of them leave with a big stack of things, but uh, they get to print a picture of an engraving of Abraham Lincoln and a sailboat and a bunch of other graphics that we have. We have a form that certifies them as a printer's apprentice. Printer's apprentice is called the printer's devil. And so we tease them about being printer's devils, but they get to print a card that they can put their name on. It certifies them. Of the presses, there's kind of three categories that we have. Uh, platen presses have a bed on them where you put the type or the form, and then they press paper against the platen. And they're hand-fed presses. And then we have three cylinder presses, and these were used to print weekly newspapers many years ago. So they go back to the 1890s. The third kind of press is an automatic press, and we have some klugies, which are 
platen presses, but they're automated. So they use a vacuum system to feed the paper into the press and to take it out. And then we have typesetting equipment, and it sets type in lead. And so until the 60s, uh, news stories in a weekly newspaper and, and some dailies would have been done with a linotype. Each uh, letter has a brass mold, which is stored in the magazine of the linotype. And as you press a key, the uh, letters are released mechanically and they assemble into a line and then you cast a line of type in lead. And now we're going to cast the line. I've assembled it so it would be like one line of a news story and I'm going to send it up. It's going to go over. It's going to come down and when this elevator comes down, uh, a uh, plunger will force 500 degree lead into the mold to cast the line. And then the lead was melted down at the end of the week. In the case of a weekly, you'd tear the pages down and remelt the lead and start over the next week. That machine was invented in 1885 and it was a huge event because from 1452 on, every printer dreamed of some way to automate the typesetting process so that you didn't have to pick each letter individually out of a drawer to set a story. And so uh, newspapers generally didn't have many pages in them, partly because of lack of advertising maybe, but also be just because of the arduous task of hand setting each letter uh, in, in a news story. And so that uh, was a major turning point in the printing industry. Well, my wife Lee and I have two weekly newspapers. The newspapers we have now are the Prairie Pioneer at Pollock and the Emmons County Record in Linton. Since I grew up in a weekly newspaper and I grew up with this equipment, it's just sort of a, I, I enjoy it. If you see where you've been, uh, you have a little bit more grasp of maybe where we're going. And here, this technology essentially goes back to 1452 uh, and you see the struggle that people went through and how hard they had to work, but you also see that change continues. And so you look ahead 10 years or 100 years or 50 years, things are going to be a lot different, just as they are as you look back. And so I think it's a, a window to the future in a way, even though we're looking back. The Lake of the Woods County Historical Society Museum in Baudette, Minnesota is a little gem of a place nestled way up on the northern tip of Minnesota. Its mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the history of the county. Lake of the Woods County Historical Society was formed in 1965. And then the museum was built and finished in 1980. And then we expanded in 1989. And then just two years ago, we built on an event center. Lake of the Woods County was formed in 1923. Before that, we were Beltrami County. Um, there is about 7,800 square miles in the county. And then there's about 4,000 people. We have Zippel Bay State Park, the Northwest Angle. There's Garden Island is a state park up there. There's also Norris Camp out to the west, which is a CCC camp. We have exhibits spanning from archaeology to the fire of 1910, domestic life, school life, pretty much all different facets of life. October 7th, I believe, a train spark caused the fire, and it just grew really rapidly because it's really dry here. It started from the west and then moved to the east, and it engulfed a good chunk of the county all of Bedette and Spooner, west to like Pitt and Grayston. 42 people died, 27 are in a mass grave. It killed your livestock and any chance of logging. So the logging industry changed over to agriculture because you can't log without trees. Everything was gone in just two hours and then they were able to rebuild and things were kept going the next year. We have a bar. Originally, it was from Rainy River and then it moved over to Spooner, so after the fire. And it was there until, I think, the 80s. 
people will come in and remember going over to Eastside Bar or Camp One. The Nickelodeon is always a hit. It's like a player piano, so you put a nickel in and it plays eight different instruments. We have a printing press. It still works. We have a guy who used to work on it and he can clean it and reset all of the type and run it. We have a lot of archives and photographs. We have well over a thousand photographs and postcards. We try to do a program once a month. Summer school kids come during the summer. And then we have second and fifth graders come each year. We're starting a new program where we do coffee and conversation every other week in the winter. And then the opposite weeks, I go over to the senior center and I bring things over to get those memories on tape. Lake of the Woods County, it's sort of up in the middle of nowhere. Like I tell people that I live up on the Canadian border and they just think, oh, Brainerd. I'm like, no, no, like literally on the border. Um, so you have that interaction between the two countries. I think it has a really unique history. There's CCC history, there's fishing, there's the train, there's the fire of 1910. I'd like to get more interactive things. I'd like to do something that's more recent history to everybody. So kind of put a 1950s or 60s kitchen. Try to use some of the oral histories into the exhibits and just more tactile things. I'd like to get more younger kids in. The older generation is great, but like <laughs> the younger generation is what's gonna keep sustaining the museum. The museum relies heavily on volunteers. We have looking back column in the newspaper. So it says 10 years back, 20 years back, 30 years back. And so a volunteer will just pick a year and then they'll write five events that happened that week in that year. We have other people who just come in and clean, other people who type, inventory, textiles, file things. If you come in, I will find you something to do. <laughs>
song And gladness waiting everywhere All your life long And may God hold you in his hand And may God hold you If you know of an artist, topic, or organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. You can watch this and other episodes of Prairie Mosaic on Prairie Public's YouTube channel. And please follow Prairie Public on social media as well. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Matt Oline. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.